In this lesson, we'll review the concept of generalized sampling and we'll explore the situation when the basis functions are not orthogonal and we'll use the computational software package MATLAB to demonstrate how we can efficiently solve for the optimal sampling coefficients. Well, the idea of generalized sampling is to approximate some signal by an expansion over some set of basis functions, phi sub k, where the values alpha are the sampling coefficients. Now because a particular basis set might not fully represent all signals, we typically select the sampling coefficients to minimize the integrated square error between the original signal and its sampled approximation. The optimal coefficients, then, are determined as the solution to a linear system of equations that depends on the inner products between all pairs of basis functions and their inner products between each basis function and the signal that is being sampled. In all practical applications, we'll typically restrict the sampling to a finite set of coefficients and basis functions. And this will allow us to find the sampling coefficients as the solution of a system of linear equations where the elements of the vector alpha are the sampling coefficients and the elements of the vector x are the inner products between the basis functions and the signal. And finally, the elements of the matrix H are the inner products between the basis functions. Once we determine the inner products of the sampling functions and the signal x, the computational burden of solving for the sampling coefficients will depend on the structure for the matrix H. Regardless of the basis functions, the matrix H will always be symmetric, meaning that it will not change if we take its transpose. That property, though, doesn't provide a lot of advantage for computing the solution to the system of equations. In many situations, though, the matrix will have another property whereby the elements along any diagonal are equal. All elements along the main diagonal, for instance, might have the same value. Then all of the elements along the first off diagonal in the upper direction might have the same value, which, because of the matrices symmetry, would, would also be the same values along the first off diagonal in the lower direction. And this will happen for every diagonal in the matrix. Now the generic notation that I'm using for these elements shows that there might be some fundamental function h sub 0 that describes these values as a function of the absolute difference between the row and the column indices in the matrix. The main diagonal has no difference between the row and column indices whereas the first off diagonal has a difference of 1, the second a difference of 2, the third a difference of 3, and so on. Now a matrix that has this property is called a symmetric toplets matrix, and symmetric toplets matrices are very important for computational science and engineering. To see this, note that in general, a 6 by 6 matrix like the one I've shown here would have 6 squared or 36 unique values. Now if that matrix is symmetric, then it would have 21 unique values. But if it is a symmetric toplets matrix, then it could have at most 6 unique values, one for each of the diagonals. Now this reduction in the number of unique values can have significant impact on the amount of data that we have to store and the number of computations we have to carry out when we solve a system of equations. It's important then that we utilize this structure when we implement our computational methods. As an example, let's take a look at a basis set built from triangular functions. Here, for instance, is the basis function for the index k equals 0. Now, this is the standard triangle with a base width equal to 2w and a height equal to 1. Each additional basis function would be obtained by shifting the fundamental basis function to the right or to the left. The function that is centered above w, for instance, would correspond to the index k equal to 1. The triangle function centered on negative 2w would correspond to k equal minus 2. Now with a little calculus work, we can show that the inner product of any of these basis functions with themselves is equal to 2 times w over 3. 
and the inner product of any basis function with its nearest neighbor to the right or left is equal to w over 6. And the inner product of any basis function with another that is more than one index away, so for instance this one with this one, that would always be 0 because those triangles have no places where they overlap. The matrix H then might look like this for the situation where we want to determine six coefficients. Now regardless of the number of non-zero coefficients we're trying to identify, this matrix would be completely determined by only two values, those on the main diagonal and those along the first off diagonal. So we'd want to be sure to use this fact when we solve our system of equations to find the sampling coefficients. Now to illustrate sampling with a non-orthogonal basis, let's use a two-cycle sinusoidal pulse that extends over a two-second interval, and we'll use MATLAB to create this signal and then sample it. Now to create and plot this function, I created a time variable in MATLAB that I called t, which is just an index over the interval from minus 2 to 2 uh, with 5,000 sample points. And then the signal I'll define as a function using MATLAB's fu uh, inline function command that is the sine of 2 pi t, so it's a sinusoid with a period or a frequency of 1. And then I'll, I'll multiply it by a rectangle, essentially, to have it be 0 outside of the interval beyond minus 1 and 1. Now to sample an arbitrary function like the one that I just defined, I wrote a MATLAB function that I call triangle sampling. The inputs to this function are x, which is the reference to a function that defines the signal that I'm sampling, and that would be the sinusoid that I just set up, k, which is an array of integer indices that specify the spatial location of the basis functions over which I'll sample, and w, which specifies the width of the basis functions. Well, to determine the kth coefficient, I can either shift the basis function or the signal, as is shown in these two equations. And for the purposes of implementing this code, it's much simpler to shift the signal that we're sampling. Therefore, I create a new function, y of t, and that's simply x of t shifted by k times the triangle's width. Then I create the fundamental triangle function of width w, and then I create another function that's the product of these two functions. And then I use MATLAB's function integral to carry out the integral over the interval from minus w to w. Now because the indices k will in general be a vector of values, I need to let MATLAB know that the result will be vector valued, that is one integral for every index, and so I have to tell it that array valued is true. Now after I've created the inner products for the basis and the signal, I need to create the matrix of inner products for all pairs of basis functions. And because this is a sparse toplets matrix, I can set this matrix up using the MATLAB commands sparse and toplets. And doing so, especially using the sparse command, will greatly reduce the computations required to solve the system of equations. Finally, now that I've computed all of the required inner products, I can solve the system of equations by using MATLAB's backslash command. Of course, there are a lot of moving parts in this code and to make all of this happen, so be sure to go through each line of this code to make sure that you understand what's happening at each step. Now, because I'm working with a signal that is well defined by the sine function, I'm using MATLAB's ability to carry out numerical integration of functions to implement this example. For other situations for which we have sample values rather than a functional form for the signal x of t, those inner products between the signal and the basis functions might need to be handled differently. Now to reconstruct the signal from its samples, I'll need a function that takes as input the sample coefficients alpha, the basis indices at which the coefficients were obtained, k, the width of the triangle functions, w, and an array of times t at which I'd like to evaluate the reconstructed signal. To take advantage of MATLAB's ability to work with arrays, I'll first put the basis indices k and the time values t into two-dimensional indices with the mesh grid command. 
Then I'll make sure that the coefficient array is a column vector, and I'll create a matrix of the triangle basis functions. The rows of this matrix will correspond to time, and the columns will correspond to the basis indices. Finally, I'll reconstruct the signal by using the matrix vector multiply in MATLAB. Again, be sure to take the time to understand each of these operations because these principles will be important for functions that utilize other types of basis functions. Now to test the reconstruction, I could start by specifying a width for the triangle basis functions. The width I've shown here, 0.4 seconds, shouldn't produce a great reconstruction because the period for the signal I'm trying to sample is one second, and this width is nearly half of that period. Well, proceeding, next I'll define the set of coefficient indices that I'll use for my sampling and reconstruction. Because the spacing between basis functions is W, I can figure out which indices are needed to span, say, from negative 1.5 seconds out to 1.5 seconds by dividing those times by the sample space spacing. Now I've picked those times because I know that the signal I'm sampling is limited to the interval minus 1 to 1, so this should give me plenty of room to cover that interval. Once I have the indices k, the width w, I can use that function x that I defined earlier and go get the sample coefficients. Then I can reconstruct the signal for some specified times over an interval that spans, say, the minus 2 to 2 seconds that I set up in the variable t originally. Then I can plot both the original signal and the reconstructed signal, and we'll see how well they match. Well, as expected, with the sample spacing set to 0.4 seconds, the reconstructed signal, which is shown in red, has some of the general features of the signal we're sampling, but the reconstruction is a rather poor representation. If I go back and change the width to 0.2, with this closer sample spacing, we're going to get a better approximation, but we still see some obvious errors. At 0.1 second, we get a much better approximation, but we see some problems here at the peaks and at the valleys. At 0.05, we can barely see some approximation error again at the peaks and the valleys. And if we drop it to 0.01 seconds, we can see no errors at all at the resolution of this plot. Now looking back through these results, we can see the clear advantage of using a smaller sample spacing. So we move from 0 0.4 to 0 0.2 to 0 0.1 to 0.05 and then down to 0.01. But with finer sampling comes more computation and storage, so the challenge is always to select the sample spacing that provides a satisfactory trade-off between accuracy and computation. So spend some time getting to understand this example, and then you should be ready to try other examples with different signals and different basis functions.